Welcome back to our continuing coverage. Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the United Nations General Assembly put Pakistan on the mat without naming the country on the issue of terrorism. He also called out China, saying expansionism remains a threat. He spoke of need to know about the origins of COVID-19. Now, during the Prime Minister's speech, he spoke of the big Make in India push on vaccines. The Prime Minister spoke of the need for the world to come together and come make in India on vaccines is what Prime Minister Narendra Modi... group is the worst of the worst. So today it seems that the so-called 2.0 or 2.25 is even worse than 1.0. So that is the whole challenge and that is the dilemma that is posed to the international community because they are in effective power. Uh, let me again mention what is rankling a little, and I was also surprised, is that the talk of inclusive administration in Taliban seems to have been diluted both in the India-US joint statement and in the Quad joint statement. There is no mention of inclusive administration in uh, Afghanistan. Lisa Curtis, how would you read this then? Uh, you know, the effort all along was that ethnic groups, the Tajiks, uh, the Uzbeks, Hazaras, women, all of them would be brought into this establishment. That clearly doesn't seem to be happening. Are democracies, instead of pushing Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban, to be more inclusive, are they actually letting Taliban use their might to call the shots, ma'am? Well, I, I really hope not, because then we have no chance to ensure that Afghanistan doesn't again become a terrorist safe haven. Uh, so I, th I think that um, that is correct, that we should not back down from demanding an inclusive Afghan government. And it was very disappointing to see that Sirajuddin Haqqani was made the interior minister. This is a, a known terrorist leader with uh, U.S. blood on his hands, not to mention um, Afghan, uh, so many other uh, nationalities as well. Uh, but the point is that the interim government is a hardline government. Uh, yes, the Haqqanis have the upper hand. Um, this is very problematic. There, there is no way that uh, the U.S. should even consider recognizing a Taliban government that has known terrorist leaders um, as part of the, the government. That and is yet completely remain. unacceptable. And is, is, is this... You know, Pakistan pushing this thing mentality that pushed the world, ultimately, uh, the world will relent. And that is why you have the Haqqani network that's calling the shots, the Doha faction, they've been completely sidelined. But in a way, in all of this, is Pakistan also playing a very dangerous game? Kamar Chima, uh, the world is looking at the situation very closely, but Imran Khan... He thought that he would come to New York, address the United Nations General Assembly, sought a, a, a summit with the US President Joe Biden, and that clearly didn't happen, despite an effort made by your foreign minister and your national security advisor, let alone a summit, not even a phone call. Is that a loss of face for Pakistan? Well, I think we understand that the Pakistan-US relations have always been transactional. So we do not have high hopes... Uh, in this post-U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, we understand uh, this is a complex situation and the Americans are reviewing the situation, which means that uh, they do not uh, high rate Pakistan's position and they understand that uh, uh, Pakistan does not support much of the uh, position of the United States in Afghanistan. And particularly, Secretary Blinken spoke at the Congress a few weeks ago and said that Pakistan has worked against our interest and for our interest in Afghanistan. So we do not agree to the Americans on everything. So we have we have kept that position. But f uh, as far as Imran Khan's face saving is concerned, uh, uh, for many, it will be a point that, yes, Imran Khan definitely wants to speak to the high level uh, at higher level in the United States. But uh, for some reasons, the Americans don't want to engage with the prime minister, which is a challenge for Prime Minister Imran Khan as well, because uh, that is also considered as one of his foreign policy challenge for not having a normal relation with the Americans to whom it Pakistan has engaged for, for 20 years. And Pakistan has given 
80,000 lives, but yet Americans do not trust Pakistan. So this is one of the challenge uh, for the for the no, entire but Pakistan's that's the point uh, that India was making, apprentice. and Lisa Curtis, India has made that point that uh, Pakistan uh, is an arsonist that pretends or disguises itself as a firefighter. But has the U.S. Uh, you know when it was the Trump administration, it was uh, it was argued that the U.S. had seen through. Pakistan's double game. But the current administration, in your appreciation, what do you make of Joe Biden not meeting Imran Khan despite repeated requests of Pakistan's foreign minister and national security advisor? Is this only temporary? And ultimately, will America give in and incentivize Pakistan supporting the Haqqani network? Well, I think it's clear the U.S. and Pakistan are uh, com on completely divergent paths when it comes to their interests in Afghanistan. Pakistan very much supports the Haqqani network. Uh, Pakistan feels very comfortable having Haqqani leaders in positions of power because they feel like they have more influence and they're better able to control uh, the Haqqanis. Somebody like Berater, who spent eight years in a Pakistani jail, is somebody the Pakistanis would not be particularly comfortable with because somebody like like Berater would seek more distance from Pakistan. Uh, but at the same time, the Haqqani Network, it's a State Department designated foreign terrorist organization. Uh, they've committed terrorism against U.S. citizens, killed U.S. citizens. And so there's just no reconciling these two very divergent positions. With regard to whether uh, President Biden will engage with Imran Khan, I think it depends on you know, what happens moving forward? Um, will Pakistan uh, try to play a more helpful role in terms of allowing moderates to, to come up and, and um, you know, encourage uh, that kind of future for Afghanistan? We, we haven't seen it so far, but I think it, it really depends on what Pakistan does moving forward. I think right now Pakistan is testing. It's seeing how much it can get away with how much uh, the international community will just sort of back down and accept uh, what's happening at face value. And that's why I think it's so important for the U.S. to work with like-minded countries like India, like the European Union, like the U.K., set down some conditions for its engagement with the Taliban and, uh, you know, be be firm on that. Come but at this are we all on the same page? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Sriram Cholia, whether it's India or the United States of America or European countries, are they on the same page or... Can Pakistan follow that Chinese template and say something to A, B, C, and D and continue to get away with terror? Yeah, this is called triangulation um, in politics. Uh, but I don't think Pakistan can really uh, find a way out of its uh, own uh, corner that it's dug itself in. You know, it's now so dependent on China and to a lesser extent on Qatar and Turkey. And that's about it, you know, and it doesn't really have much international support. And like you're mentioning, Gaurav, the kind of snub that Imran Khan got from uh, Joe Biden, it clearly shows that, you know, there's nothing that the U.S. really expects from Pakistan in a positive sense. I mean, and that's how the world has come to see Pakistan now. You know, there's nothing positive from coming from them. Okay. So at least they should not do bad things. Before at I bring in Ambassador Vishnu Prakash different. on red lines, Lisa Curtis, does the U.S. have defined red lines that this is what they expect of the Afghanistan government uh, if money is to be paid or if uh, resources have to be pumped in uh, to restore democracy in whatever form uh, in Afghanistan, even if you make all that democracy un under Taliban rule. Uh, so for example, take action against the Haqqani network. Uh, he's the interior minister. Or bring in Mullah Baradar as the prime minister. He's currently deputy uh, prime minister. Or bring in uh, Stanik Zai. Or no such defined red lines, ma'am. Well, I think that this is being worked out now behind the scenes. I, I don't see any uh, particularly firm red lines at the moment. Um, but as I said, I, th I think that's really important because I think, unfortunately, the way the U.S. negotiated the Doha agreement, very weak agreement, uh, in a sense, it emboldened the Taliban. So, you know, we're in this position where the Taliban has felt emboldened by the way the U.S. negotiator has treated them over the last three years with uh, real kid gloves. So I think that we need to demonstrate that uh, it won't be acceptable to have terrorist leaders as part of the government. It won't be acceptable to uh, 
not allow girls to go to school, women to work, um, you know, that that there will have to be a, a level of respect for human rights if the Taliban has any hope of being recognized by the rest of the international community. But no, I, to answer your question, I don't think those red lines have been set yet. And that's why I think it's so important when it, leaders like Prime Minister Modi do set down some of those red lines. So perhaps they can have some influence on this entire process. And these red lines are extremely important, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, uh, as Lisa Curtis also points out, uh, women's rights, women, they should have access to education, they should have access to work. What we are seeing on ground, on the contrary, is flogging is back. Men are being hung from cranes, they're being hanged uh, openly. Taliban not following the, any, any of these rules. So what is Taliban's effort in your view? Are they sending across a message or is Pakistan sending across that message that we will do what we want, ultimately the world will relent? Gaurav, I I am afraid I do not see the U.S. having red lines. And if they have red lines, they are cast in sand. U.S. has already dropped Afghanistan effectively like a hot potato. They had decided that, you know, enough was enough. They had, it was a millstone around the American neck. The U.S. attention has already shifted to China and, and uh, South China Sea, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm afraid uh, sooner than later, at least this round, Pakistan will prevail again. They will play the waiting game. They will tire out the community and some kind of a compromise will be found. Uh, Taliban will give some assurances which will be taken at face value to be forgotten. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but that is how my feeling or assessment of the situation. Gaurav. Aviruk, is that also your appreciation? Welcome back, Aviruk. Is that also your appreciation that uh, Pakistan waited out the US for two decades and when we say Taliban, does it actually mean Taliban backed by Pakistan's ISI? Uh, I actually, I mean, there, there are several excellent points made by a number of speakers here. But somehow I get the feeling that, uh, that you know, the kind of control that we, we, we believe that Pakistan has over all of these groups, and there are many in, in Afghanistan, is total and complete. And it's like as if, as if they are the puppeteers. I don't think in a chaotic country like that, that is even possible which is why you have a civil war like situation in any case so if we narrow this down so about, to the haqqani network does pakistan to, have a vice like to... grip on the haqqani network let's break this down so sure, they may not I have control I... over mullah brother they may not have control over uh, Sher abbas tanikzai but what about the haqqani network no of course it does of course it does to a much greater extent than the other groups perhaps but let's let's take a step back and look at taliban 2.0 now, Taliban 2.0, how did this happen? The, Taliban, the difference between Taliban 1.0 and 2.0 is that Taliban 2.0 was legitimized, in a sense, without making any concrete promises or taking any steps. I don't think anybody in their right minds thought that they wouldn't take over the country by whatever means at the time of the US withdrawal. I don't think, I mean, there are, there are people uh, much better qualified than me on this panel who, I mean, I put the question to them, what, did, did any of them really believe that suddenly Afghanistan would turn into a democracy and Taliban would become a secular liberal uh, sort of entity? Democ I don't think anyone in their right mind would have thought that. But what's happened as a result of the Trump administration, frankly, and I think Lisa mentioned this earlier, for the last three years, there's been a legitimization of the Taliban. Now, that presents an opportunity for the Taliban as well to actually, you know, capitalize on that. Okay. Not necessarily by violence, but by doing, well, a, a few more acceptable things. So it actually presents an opportunity as well. But they haven't I mean, done a they, single, you know, not, whether, you know, not a single acceptable thing. But Lisa Curtis, Merit and Ambassador Vishnu Prakash uh, and Aviruk saying that one, the Americans legitimized Taliban. Two, uh, perhaps the Americans thought enough is enough. Two decades, let's focus on, you know, the Indo-Pacific. Forget about Afghanistan. And ultimately, Pakistan, after waiting it out for two decades, will call the shots in this region, in AFPAC. 
It is clear the Biden administration has uh, shifted attention to the Indo-Pacific, to competing with China. And that is where the majority of United States resources, effort, diplomacy should go, frankly. Uh, we were in Afghanistan for 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I think that the decision was made, for better or for worse, may not have been my decision, but the president has made the decision to withdraw U.S. troops. So let's look at how we move forward. And, uh, you know, I would advise the Biden administration not to turn its back on Afghanistan. We've done that in the past. We saw what happened in the early 1990s yes. when the U.S. turned away from Afghanistan. It led to the path to 9-11. Uh, we can't have that happen again. So we do have to continue to monitor the situation. We have to maintain counterterrorism capabilities, uh, maintain the ability to, to strike if necessary in Afghanistan, uh, but also to try to shape the the way the Taliban is going to govern the country and the way they're going to uh, relate to terrorists. Okay. Uh, so we, we need to continue, we, need, we can continue to do both. It's not an either or proposition and particularly for India. India has to worry about its Western border oh, while also seeking to project uh, influence eastward in Southeast Asia uh, and East Asia. So, so the great game you know, is it's on. not going to be possible to ignore Afghanistan, even as we focus more of our attention on the Indo-Pacific. And when we say focus on Afghanistan, and I have Raymond Vickery Jr., a senior associate, uh, Vadwani chair, the U.S.-India Policy Studies, joining me on the broadcast. Raymond Vickery, when we say focus on Afghanistan, is the clear indication, as Prime Minister Narendra Modi said at the United Nations General Assembly, Terrorism is a double-edged sword. Don't use Afghanistan uh, as, as of that territory to spread terror in the region. It could hurt you. So the focus needs to be very squarely on Pakistan backing the Taliban in Afghanistan. Well, I don't think there's any question uh, that there is a shift in the understanding of the United States of America to be more cooperative uh, and more sympathetic uh, to the Indian point of view in regard to terrorism whether it's from Afghanistan or originating on Pakistan territory. What has happened is a fundamental reevaluation, it seems to me, uh, which really in the United States is bipartisan uh, of our uh, commitment in how we conduct it. It's one thing to have spent, as the United States did, more than a trillion dollars, thousands of American lives, uh, and a great deal of time and effort over 20 years, uh, it, but we have not come up with a successful way of being able to counteract um, uh, radical Islamic uh, terrorism, authoritarianism uh, from that side. I'm very pleased to see that in the joint statement from the Quad meeting yesterday, there is uh, explicit reference uh, to Afghanistan, to cross-border terrorism, uh, and the need to cooperate on that. Uh, that goes along with what happened vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, free movement in the Indo-Pacific, which is a uh, code word for the South China and East China Seas, of course, and even uh, uh, as far afield as the Korean Peninsula and no, Myanmar. Your, but in your appreciation, uh, and before I bring in Kamar Chima quickly, sir, does that mean more pressure on Pakistan? Will the United States also be on the same page with India in mounting pressure on Pakistan to rein in these terrorist groups, whether it's the Haqqani network uh, of the Taliban or lashkar e taiba and jaish e Mohammed? Well, is that question uh, it is for to, you, to sir. me? Yes. Yes. Uh, for me, I believe uh, that it's not a question of pressure necessarily. It's a question of the United States and India uh, taking a new and clear eyed view of uh, Pakistan and the dual game that has been played there uh, for for decades. Uh, the fact is uh, that uh, Pakistan uh, gave uh, a zone of, um, of uh, operation uh, which uh, aided uh, the Taliban. The fact is uh, that Pakistan uh, was not helpful in regard 
Osama bin Laden and actually protested when we brought uh, that miscreant uh, to justice. Yes. So I think that it's not a question of pressuring, it's a question of being able to deal more effectively with Pakistan. There are elements in Pakistan who want to do the right thing, but okay. there are other elements, uh, particularly uh, in the security uh, area, the, the I, ISI and so forth, that uh, uh, we need to take a, a, a better and more clear-eyed view. So that is... What does a better uh, and clear-eyed view mean in terms of action on ground? Because India has been dealing with this situation for decades. And before I bring in uh, Aviruk Sen and Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, I want to quickly bring in uh, Kamar Chima into this conversation. Kamar Chima, you've seen the joint statement, uh, the bilateral joint statement, you've seen the Quad statement, you've heard Prime Minister Narendra Modi at UNGA. Will Pakistan now, will Imran Khan now be under more pressure to take action against uh, terrorists on Pakistani soil and try to rein in the hardline elements in Taliban? Well, the, the first thing is that uh, we have maintained our position that whatever little influence we have on the Taliban, we will exercise that. That is the first thing. We do not have an absolute influence on the Taliban. The second thing is, as far as the terrorist organizations are concerned, Pakistan has, is one of the leading nations which have eliminated the terror infrastructure in Pakistan and wherever the terrorist organizations are operating. I very specifically asked you about people. terrorist organizations like lashkar e taiba and jaish e mohammed UN-designated global terrorist organizations on your soil, sir. Yes, sir. No, 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 let me come to that point. The, 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 the groups which were the military troops which were related to the Pakistan's eastern border, every one of those have dropped the weapons. The cases are against them. They have The cases are registered. Uh, they're facing the charges in the courts and obviously the law will take its course. And above all, we are not doing it for the pressure of anyone. We are doing it because this is the state's policy that no one can pick up weapon and can go for jihad anywhere. There was a policy in the past, which was uh, with the support of the Americans and the many uh, to go for jihad, like in Afghanistan. But right now, Pakistan is the one country which gave lives. We eliminated the terror infrastructure. Those okay. who are left, they, they are behind bars. Uh, Lisa Curtis, I'm sure nobody in India will buy this, given uh, the latest intelligence inputs that are coming in, the operations that have taken place along the line of control with three terrorists being eliminated just, just two days ago and a large amount of arms and ammunition being recovered from those dead terrorists. But will America buy this in today's day and age? Well, look, uh, I think we, we need to look at the facts on the ground and, you know, who are the individuals who have been charged? You know, are these the the, the top leaders that we know about uh, that have been involved in terrorist acts in Pakistan? Um, what has been done with re, re, uh, regard to reining in terrorist financing? You know, these are things that the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force Committee, is looking at on a regular basis. Um, when I was in the uh, previous administration, uh, certainly Pakistan had begun to meet some of those benchmarks um, of the FATF, but they had not met all of them. So, frankly, I'm not sure where that process stands at the moment, but I'm sure the Biden administration is looking very carefully what's actually happening on the ground. What is Pakistan doing to rein in terrorist groups? And uh, so, you know, in a way, the Taliban taking over power in Afghanistan means it's too late to penalize Pakistan when it comes to its support for the Taliban. Okay. Um, you know, that's done. But when it comes to these other groups that you're talking about, the LET, the JEM, uh, yes, we should certainly be monitoring what's happening because we've seen that these groups have acted inside Indian territory. They have touched off conflicts, very dangerous um, crises situations between India and Pakistan. And we don't want the Taliban takeover to re-inspire these groups and to cause uh, chaos and havoc Which in the region. Which unfortunately is, is happening also. These are live images uh, I want to cut across to New York. The Prime Minister is now on his way to the airport. He will be flying back to India, but uh, you know, shaking hands with the Indian diaspora. This is uh, almost a ritual now. Let's dip in and listen in for a moment.
Of course, uh, there are COVID uh, restrictions in place, but uh, people keen to talk to the Prime Minister, uh, shake hands with him. A lot of people taking selfies with the Prime Minister, as you see in these images. And they've waited long hours, they've waited long hours to uh, meet the Prime Minister uh, and take this selfie with him. I was covering the Prime Minister's visit uh, last time and people were there from, from early in the morning. Early in the morning, they waited several hours, men, women, children, with their picnic baskets, food baskets, with the tricolour fluttering high. Uh, Lisa Curtis, uh, that was also the time that uh, Howdy Modi was a big event, but the Indian diaspora, they've turned out in big numbers each time the Prime Minister was in the United States of America. Uh, does that, does that, how does the US look at it, ma'am? Well, I think that, uh, you know, in the United States, there's not quite as much focus on what's happening in terms of uh, the Indian Prime Minister visiting the United States. There's obviously a lot more focus in India about uh, what's happening there. Uh, but I think, you know, that's right. He obviously has a, a great deal of support in the United States, probably throughout the diaspora, throughout the world. Um, there's a lot of support for, for Prime Minister Modi. Um, and uh, so I think that that is quite obvious. And you talked about the the Howdy Modi event, which took place in Texas, of course, in um, 2019. I guess it was it was uh, two years ago, uh, and that was quite an event to see the the tens of thousands of Indian Americans turning out. Um, so there's a lot of pride, I think, among the diaspora community for their country. Um, they're proud of the contributions that they have made in the United States, um, rising to you know senior uh, positions within the government, within the U.S. Congress. Um, had an uh, Indian American astronaut um, rising to the high levels in the technology sector. Um, so I think what what you see when the Indian American community turns out for Prime Minister Modi is just a lot of pride in their country and a lot of pride in the progress that's been made in the US-India relationship. And it is these people-to-people -people ties that do provide the real ballast behind the relationship. Uh, but in addition, we have this converging strategic interest as well, and the, the joint interest in competing with China, making sure that China doesn't dominate uh, the Indo-Pacific region. And in counterterrorism, both our countries are, are linked at the hip in, in wanting to counter terrorism and seeing this as um, antithetical to uh, the democratic process. And were you and surprised at the mention? Were you surprised at the mention of um, seeking origin, uh, wanting to know more about the origin of COVID vaccine, and saying that this is where United Nations, if it wants to remain relevant it needs to reform and covid origins being one of those issues is that uh, you know in a way directly taking on china yeah i'm really pleased to see that that issue was raised because it is important uh the pandemic has impacted everybody in the world it's still impacting us it's impacting our economies um it's resulted in the deaths of you know hundreds of thousands of people so we certainly should get the facts and China needs to be transparent about uh, patient zero. Uh, how did this start? How did China deal with it in the early days? And it, it, it's unacceptable.